is replicate on um, so what does it mean for us to be a sustainable church? Um, and we're getting we're gearing up towards the end. Um, we're going to be we're get, we're heading towards that final level. So we've already looked um, at all these things. Um, how as we go in, the soil is spiritually prepared, laying that spiritual foundation for God. We talked about planting gospel seeds and evangelism, what that looks like as God's word um, enters our lives and breaks through in the ground of our community. As we looked at that, we realized that we begin to grow roots into our communities. We learn about social problems. What are the things going on in our neighborhood that we need to engage in, right? And as, that, as those roots grow in um, to our communities, that at the same time, we're allowing God's word to grow into our lives, right? And when that happens, we begin to sprout up, we talked about. And that's where ministry comes from. As we know about the issues going on in our neighborhood, now we know what ministries, ways that we can serve, reach out in our community, right? We're in a rural hillside village of Thailand. Ministry should look different, right, than in urban Bangkok. So, um, so then we begin to grow these branches of ministry and of leaders. We talked about the five roles of leadership needed um, for church growth. And we'll look at that more um, in the future here. Um, and then we talked about producing fruit, how as disciples we make disciples, how as gathered communities we're multiplying in our missional communities and ultimately as a church. Um, and then uh, we've been on the series of organic life. What is this organic body life? What is the church? We talked about how as a community in the church, we're a family on mission together, right? Um, and as a family on mission, we bond in a special way. Um, we also talked about our gathering, how we, we focus together at the kingdom table. Um, we're not just a club, um, but we're a family that eats and spends life together. Um, yesterday, we spent time with uh, Sister Yui. Do some of you know Yui? Um, you know, her grandmother had just passed away. Um, just a few weeks back, um, Nong Joy, um, her father had passed away, right? Um, so we, we, when we're a family, you know, we spend time together. Sometimes that means mourning and crying um, together. Sometimes the Thai funerals can last a long time. I think that Yui's um, grandfather's funeral lasted a week because, uh, because her grandfather was Buddhist. So they'll only, they'll only do the, do the um, what is it called? You burn the body. They only do the cremation. They only do the cremation on like an auspicious day. So, um, so they have to wait until it's that long. So, um, so the church all week long, it was, it was neat to see they'd gone to the temple to encourage her during that time. That's what family life looks like, right? Um, so today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about love in the church because we talk about being a church together and sharing organic like together. Um, we have to talk about love within the body because it's what we need in order to stay strong as a family. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn this off. So uh, what I wanna do is, I don't, I don't have dry erasers. I was gonna mark a few things, but I want us to look at a few passages because throughout the New Testament, we see Paul and other church writers charging the church um, and reminding them of basically, you know, how to get along. How is it that you're going to be living out your lives together? And he gives them these reminders. Uh, and I first want to look in the book of Philippians in chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Give you a minute to, to open up there. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at a few of these passages. We don't have a lot of time this morning, but I want to look at a few of these passages um, and look at what is the picture that we're getting of this loving family that we see um, Paul charging the church to be. There's a, you can do studies. Maybe some of you have heard sermons um, or you've done a study on the one another passages in the Bible. That's kind of what we're going to be what we're going to be looking at, but I don't, we're not going to go verse by verse, but you can do it on your own if you want, you know, just on your phone, your app, just search uh, under the quotes, one another, and you'll see all these verses of what we're called to do uh, for one another in the church. So in Philippians chapter two, starting in verse one, Paul charges the church. This is what he says in verse one. He says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, he says, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, he says, fill my joy by thinking the same way and having the same love and sharing the same feelings and focusing on one goal. 
basically what I see Paul saying there in those first couple of verses is if you're getting, if you're getting anything, if you're getting anything out of the joy of being a church, right? He says, if there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation in love, any, any thanksgiving in your fellowship, if you've gotten anything out of that spirit that's filled you, he says, if there's any affection, any warm feelings from this grace, this mercy of God, he says, I want you to do something for me. <laughs> he says, I want you to make me happy in this way. If you're getting anything, any blessings out of the church, he says, fill my joy by thinking the same way. He says, by having the same love and sharing those same feelings and focusing on one goal. And he says in verse three, he says, do nothing then out of rivalry or conceit. What is those are kind of big English words. What is rivalry and conceit? What is, what is a rivalry? Yeah, rival means competition, which is kind of like fancy for fighting. Normally, like, if we're a rival, um, normally, it's, normally it's like the other team, right? You're fighting against each other. It's competition, but it's kind of your enemies to an extent, right? And what is conceit? What is conceited? What does conceit mean? Thinking uh, you're better than you are. Yeah, when you're conceited, this is a word that high school girls in America will start to say a lot. Oh, so-and-so, she's so conceited, right? Um, It means that you think really big of yourself, right? When you're conceited, that's, oh, you know that you're you're the best and you want everyone to know that, right? So he says, he says, don't think of yourself as this big hotshot person, right? And he says, I don't want you to look at your brothers and sisters in the church as if they're your enemies. He says, don't do anything out of rivalry. It's not about, it's not just about you in your own way. He says, in contrast, he says, but in humility, humility is the opposite of of conceit, right? He says, in humility, he says, consider others as more important than yourself. This is his chart. He says, I want you to look at your church family. You think of them as bigger than yourself. In verse 4, he says, everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So when we're in the church, we've talked about this a lot already. So, um, but as we're in the church, we know the focus isn't on us, right? Um, but it's also about our family. Because so we need to be learning how to share our time together, how we can look to one another's needs within our body. Um, and then we won't, we won't read all of it, but through verses 5 through 11, he says, as you do this, he says, you follow the example of Jesus because he did all of this, right? That Jesus, even though he's the son of God, he lived a humble life among us. He says, you follow his example. So he wants us to say, he wants to show us as we're loving one another, that means that we're living a humble life together. The, the picture I see in painting is that we're looking and saying, oh, you know, church as I come, it's not just about what I want, but what does my brother and sister want, Right? Maybe we come together and we come to eat. And I'm like, man, rice again, more Thai food. <laughs> when are we going to get some hamburgers in here? You know, why are we always eating these things? When are we going to get some good Mexican burritos? You know, um, we learn it's not just about me, what I want, um, but what about our church family wants, right? What are the other's needs of those around us? Um, so here's a little example. I want us to look um, at Romans 12. Because I believe that Paul, he expands on these ideas in the book of Romans. In in Romans chapter 12, after Paul had been talking about um, the giftings in the church, um, in verse, verse nine, he charges us to love one another. In verse 9, he says, he says, love must be without hypocrisy, detest evil, and cling to what is good. He says, show family affection to one another with brotherly love. He says, outdo one another in showing honor. He says, do not lack diligence, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer says, share with the saints in their needs. He says, pursue hospitality. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. He says, be in agreement with one another. He says, do not be proud. Instead, associate 
uh, with, hu with humility. He says, do not be wise in your own understanding. He says, and do not repay evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. In verse 18, if it is possible on your part, he says, live at peace with everyone. Um, I want you to earmark that real quick. Mark that in your Bible. Keep that where you are. If you're on a phone, I guess you can't do that. And then turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. What is this chapter often nicknamed? What do we nickname this chapter a lot of times? What is it about? It's about love, right? You've never been to a wedding and they read this passage? Oftentimes in America, when people, when a couple gets married, we'll read this passage and we go, it's a love chapter, right? <laughs> you look at it and go, oh, it's so, it's so nice, so warm, it's so, it's so lovely, right? Um, we normally, for some reason, we jump the gun and we, we hear love and we think, we, think, um, we think that eros love, that romantic love, but it's not talking about that. This is the agape, godly love that we're called to have to one another in the church. In the context here, we see Paul now to the church in Corinth. He's sharing it the same way he did in Rome. I'm talking about the gifts and how we're all different in the church. You need to get along and appreciate each other. He says you need to love one another. That's when he starts to give. Um, that's when he starts to describe what this love looks like, right? Um, in verse, um, starting in verse uh, 13, he says, If I speak the language of men and of angels, but I do not have love, he says, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He's like, I have no meaning without love, basically, is what he's getting at. In verse 2, he says, If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so I can move mountains, but I do not have love, he says, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor and I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. He says, love is over all of these things. It's the greatest gift. In verse 4, he says, Because love is patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy, and it doesn't boast. It's not conceited, and it cannot, be, it cannot act improperly. It is not selfish. It's not provoked. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things, and it hopes all things, and endures all things. It says love never ends. It goes on to say in verse 13, now these, th these three things remain. It says faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these things is love, right? Um, so I want to look at these three passages and ask, ask us, uh, what kind of picture does it paint to you in your mind of what we're called to as a church? What kind of love does this look like as you, as you hear it? What is, he, what is he saying that our love should look like for one another? Yeah, sharing is talked about a lot, right? What else? What else do we see? A common threads, themes of this love that we're called to have with one another. Taking care of one another. Yeah, taking care of each other, looking after one another. That goes along with what we see the church do in Acts um, that we looked at last week, right? As they as they looked after everyone's needs. Yeah, we see a common theme of selflessness, right? Of humility. What else? What else do we see there? Mafsut, what do you see him talking about with love? About uh, one more person. How about Sarah? What do you see there? Kindness. Kind. You see kindness. Okay. Sister Sarah. Endurance. endurance. Ah. How? What do you mean by endurance? Hmm. Like, 
Yeah, I like that. It does take endurance and persistence, right? Because sometimes we're not going to feel like it. We talked about we talked about fighting a bit last week, right? Sometimes we sometimes we won't get along, right? Um, for churches like our church in Bangkok, a lot of people they ask, you know, how do you do it? Because we have so many different nationalities. Um, with the and then there's so many ties, right? If we were only if we were only a Filipino Thai church, would that be hard? Yeah, that's hard. If we're only American Thai church, that hard? Or Pakistani Thai church, that hard? Yeah, it's hard. We have so many. Um, but through love, we can come together, right? It divides those walls, like our theme we had last year, um, our bond. But it takes time. Um, we talked about last week how, as a family, when can you get rid of family? We talked about being a family last week. When do we when do we stop being family? If you have your anyone have brothers or sisters, you know when do they stop being your brothers and sisters? Yeah. Never. Right? It's a trick, trick question a little bit. Um, never, right? You can't get rid of them. <laughs> so it takes patience, right? Um, it takes patience. And the same for us as a church. You know, we're a family. That means we need to learn, he's saying. You need to learn to love one another. That's why he's saying all these things, right? Go back with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to close out here in a minute. Um, Romans... Romans chapter 12, where we ended, then Paul, he goes on to talk about all these, all these differences um, that we can have um, in the body. He's going to spend a lot of time talking about um, freedoms that we have within the church, because sometimes we're going to have disagreements. And chapter 14 talks a lot about this. And he's going to say that you need to take hold of love because of this. Sometimes you're going to disagree about things that seem like a very big deal to you. I mean, you need to love one another through that. Um, so you can remain united. And he goes on to say this in chapter 13. Look here in verse 8. Um, he, says, he says, Do not owe anyone anything, he says, except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. When Jesus came, when Jesus talked about the commands, how many commandments did Jesus say that we have? What commands did Jesus give us? Yeah, he said, love one another. What else? He said, love God, right? He says, the Lord your God is one. He says, love the Lord your God. Um, so we're called to love God and we're called to love others. Um, look what he says. Look what Paul says here. He says, he says, the commandments, he says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. These are from the Ten Commandments, right? And the Ten Commandments sum up, to an extent, the Old Covenant, God's law. There are a lot of rules. There's more than ten, right? But those were ten very specific, right? The first ones had to do with God, um, what your love for God should look like, and the other five, what your love for man should look like. So Jesus said, it all comes down to this. You love God and you love others. And Paul says here, in verse 9, he says, um, if there's any other commandment, he says, they are all summed up by this. He says, just like Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. He says, love, therefore, is fulfillment of all of the law. If you take notes in your Bible, you can write down also Galatians 5.14. Paul says a very similar thing to the church in Galatia. He says, he says therefore, he says, the entire law, all of it, he says, all of it is fulfilled in one statement. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Like what Mob Suit said, right? So as we look at, as we've looked at in this, this class, this series on Replicate, we talked about how it's all leading up to the church, right? God's plan for man um, was to send his son Jesus, to die on the cross, to set us free um, through his son Jesus. And he would give us the church. He says, all the entire law is fulfilled in this. Now you love one another. Um, and Jesus, he showed us that love in his own life, right? As we think about love, what's our standard? It's Jesus, right? Uh, turn with me in closing it to 1 John. Uh, 1 John. Uh, 1 John. In chapter 3, in verse 16, this is what John writes about love. He says, this is how we have come to know love. He says, he laid down his life for us, 
and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So what is our standard of love? How is it we've come to know love? He says, Jesus has shown you, right? He showed us in his life, um, while he was alive, how he sacrificed himself, his time, his energy, but in his death. He said, Jesus, he laid down his life. This is how you know what it is. We see that love is a very big deal to God, and John explains very well why. Turn over to chapter 4. He says, 1 John chapter 4, in verse 16, it says, it says, and we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us. He says, God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Verse 17, in this, love is made mature. Love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, for we are his in this world. Um, it says, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection or maturity in love. It says, we love because he first loved us. Um, so he says here that what is love? What's our standard of love? It says God is love. It says there's something powerful about love. There's something special about this agape love, this brotherly love that we need to have because it shows God. God is this kind of love. It has something to do with his nature, his very being. Why does he, give such a, why does he make it such a big deal? Because he says, that is what I am. I want you to understand this kind of love because it's who I am. And it's what I want you as a church to be about as well. Uh, where do we end there? In verse, verse 20, he says, if anyone says, I love God. He says, basically, any of you say, you know, I'm a Christian. I love God. He says, any of you says this, yet hates his brother. He says, he's a liar. He says, for the person who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who is not seen. Man, we see once again, we see once again, uh, Jesus holding us at a high standard, right? So if we say, oh, we say, yeah, God, I love you. I know your commands, I can keep them. But yet in our lives, we show hate um, to our brothers. He says, you're lying. <laughs> Seems like you're even lying to yourself, right? He says, because if you can't love those that are there among you, you can't, you can't love God. You obviously don't understand. You obviously don't understand the love that I've given you. And in verse 21, he says, and we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. So as we talk about, as we talk about organic life, this mature life in the church family, it's only made possible um, in the time that we spend loving one another, in community with one another. And that means making sacrifices on behalf of one another. Um, and as we do that, we grow into a family. Um, like Sarah said, uh, we endure all things together. Um, as we looked at before, um, this is how this kingdom, this church in the world, it has no end because there's nothing that we can't overcome through love as a family. Um, so let's go to him together in prayer and we'll close.